The MMA Discussion Podcast is brought to you by sportsofanarchy.com. Visit our site for all your sporting news and needs. We're also brought to you by submissionfc.com. Enter the promo code SPORTSOFANARCHY10 for 10% off the best Brazilian jiu-jitsu gear. We're also brought to you by MMAprofit.com. Play MMA Fantasy for free for the chance to win 100 bucks. We're also available to be listened to, viewed, all that other good goodness on iTunes, Stitcher app, which is available on all smartphone devices. Anybody needs to listen to us on the go, please subscribe or create an account for Stitcher. It's completely free. MMA fans, we're here. Episode 19, I believe. And I'm joined here with uh, MMA discussion admin Adam. Adam, say what's up. Uh, hold on. Okay, go ahead. Say it again. All right. I, hey. I'm burnt out, man. I've okay. For anybody that watched this past UFC on Fox 14 card, I'm out. I'm so burnt. I I could not be more burnt out on my excitement. And uh, <laughs> Adam, I gotta tell you, when when this fight card, when this fight before this fight was even announced, there were rumors that Gustafson and Anthony Johnson would fight. Now I don't know if you know, but Anthony Johnson is like one of my top five. And has been for one of, for the longest time since his welterweight yeah, days. Clear over the last two years. Oh yeah, he's <laughs> one of my all-time favorite fighters to watch. And before the fight was even announced, I remember arguing with some hardcore fans that if Gus and Johnson fought, Gus would just light him up and it would be easy. It would be no challenge. And I explained it from every aspect, from my fandom to my analysis. To every kind of way I could break that fight down. I even broke, I literally broke it down for many fans how I saw that fight would go. And it literally went to a T. I broke down the game plan for Johnson, what he should do, and he did it. And man, it was awesome to see. It was one of the, one of my one of the best moments for me as a fan to watch because literally 99% of anybody that I talked to about this fight, any anybody in my MMA circle, um, on the page even, thought that Gus would would get that uh win easy and i and i just and i i i was i was even going as far to say he's gonna fight john jones and i think that he has a real good chance and i really do still but before we even get into that i was just so amped to see johnson get that win so there's my fandom two minutes of the day uh adam you saw the fight how did you what did you think well like we were talking earlier i like if you asked me to pick a winner i wouldn't be able to it was one of those fights where i didn't see any one man having a clear skill advantage except for Gustafson's reach and Jones, or Johnson's power. And I'll always take the power over anything because Dan Henderson made a career of having so-so technique, but hey, he can knock you out at any time. He won championships like that. Um, um, there's something about Anthony Johnson getting poked in the eye that makes him a killer. I don't <laughs> know what that is, but he's the best at getting poked in the eye and knocking the fuck out. I think if John Jones does that in the fight, he should just like run for the next two minutes, <laughs> and he's gonna have to do that a lot. <laughs> All right. For that fight, he's gonna have to be on his bicycle and stay on the outside. But I mean, one thing that Johnson showed in this fight is that he can he can say "fuck your reach man" and just come inside and hit you. I I don't know like. It's hard to say what Johnson's jaw is. I don't think we've ever really seen him all that hurt except for like maybe the Kachet fight back in the day, but. At light heavyweight or heavyweight, it didn't. Our lots he hurt him once. It's hard to remember. It's been a while since. That's I remember he, he, yeah, he landed a good shot on him, but it, it didn't really slow Johnson down in the sense that he, he didn't back up and, and pedal back. You know, he kind of stayed in the pocket with him, but you could tell he was visibly shooken up by it. Yeah, but I mean that's Andre Arlovski, yeah. Yeah, and one of the things, one of the biggest differences is that people were trying to compare Gus's skill set in this fight. Uh, uh, to to the one he he used in the John Jones fight, and it's just not the same kind of fight. Uh, with John Jones, he has the he had the long reach advantage in that fight. Gus didn't. Gus had to Gus had to do what Johnson had to do to him in this fight. J- Gus had to come forward. He had to get on the inside and use his reach to to the best of his ability and get and and, and stop John, Jones from utilizing his. And he did that in, in certain portions of that fight. And people were saying, you know, with, with his long reach, he'll be able to do it and, and, and get it done from the outside. And there's a chance that he could have done that. But they they were basing the fight too much on the John Jones fight, which is a totally different fight. Especially because Jones was able to land a lot of shots on Gustafson. Shots that where I, what I was saying, if Johnson could, could get the chance to land, would probably put Gus out. And Johnson, sure enough, was able to get on the inside – um and and and, uh, and and you know inflict the punishment he needed to get that finish, 
and uh, and I, and I knew that he could. I mean, he's he's got great footwork. He's got his hand speed is one of the one of the quickest in the division. I feel um, I, like like as opposed to like a Glover Teixeira or Ryan Bader, I mean, his hands are way faster. I feel, and his footwork has gotten better at, throughout the years. I paid so much attention to his striking style since the last couple of years. Actually, more so since he got cut from the UFC after the Vitor loss in in two thousand eleven. Um, uh, or was that 12? 12, right? A while ago. Yeah, it was a while ago. And I remember after that, after getting cut from there, I, I, I wanted to see if he improved. And it wasn't until he got into the World Series of Fighting, which was like three or four fights after, where I could just start seeing the improvement, the footwork, the, the counter-striking ability. Um, the, his hands have always been fast. So, I mean, that, that's just always been a weapon of his. And, uh, of course... Moving into light heavyweight what has been the best thing for, that he could have possibly done. He doesn't get tired as uh, as often. I don't think, um, you know, he's really built up that bo- that body to a light heavyweight's body. You know, because uh, when he was at welterweight, I think he was fatter because of the fact that he, you know, he didn't have as much muscle back then. Even though he was built when he when he would cut down to one seventy, and so. Um, I, I've just I've seen the improvements, and I think he's the best version of himself that he's ever been ever. And um, and so man, I, I can't wait for that that John, that John Jones fight. But yeah, that was the thing is that people were saying, you know, Gus because of what he did to John Jones, he he could be able to do it to Anthony Johnson. And I was like, that's a totally different animal he's dealing with in there. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, you can't. I, that's what I don't like about comparing fighters and fighters. I mean, they're both big and black, and that's where the similarities end. Uh, <laughs> even Johnson's. How to approach wrestling is, is more uh, shot from the outside, whereas Jones is more of a Greco style. Yeah. And Johnson hasn't really. I know he took Bill Davis down once or twice, but I mean that that's an element that people underestimate. You know, it's like why is he able to get inside all these times and hit him? Well, you got to be more about the takedown. You can't take a full striking defensive posture. You got to sit a little bit lower, have mm-hmm. a little bit more of a wrestling defense posture, and that leaves you open for strikes, especially up the middle. And mm-hmm. that's where he landed. It was right up the middle with the right hand. Um, I made a post on the page a couple of days back about how I think that legitimately you can make the case that maybe not the best in the world, but Anthony Johnson is the scariest guy to fight in the world. He, he, right now? Oh, hell yeah. Johnson, you're going to get hurt no matter win or lose. You're not going to come out the same guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I, man, I think that his skill set is there, though. I mean, looking at... Looking at him and ta- and and we'll talk about this in a minute about the, like we'll try and uh, analyze the fight with him and John Jones, but I just I I believe that he has he he's really uh, who did he, who was that trainer of his Ernesto Hoost, right or uh, who's down at uh is it a, is it Hoost at Black Aliens now I think so I believe so I mean, it is he's the greatest kickboxer of all time and that's not a bad place to learn um. I don't know. Is it yeah, I heard that he, you know, because Johnson has always had a decent kickboxing style, and it's just, yeah, I heard that Husta was 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 uh, handling him in, in, in the in the striking department for this camp, and so I was thinking like, whoa, you know, what what a guy to have in your corner, and and based on this performance, I would hope that he keeps him uh, for this title fight coming up. Um, Let's talk about the rest of the card real quick. Uh, you saw Dan Henderson and Gegard Mousasi. What did you think of that fight? Uh, it didn't, oh, I, I expected Musashi to win, I didn't think it'd be that quick, and I'm perfectly fine with the savage. Um, he went down a little funky, someone's like, he tripped, no, he was rocked, he went down, so he got hit with a punch. Yeah. Um, and as he was grabbing that single, Musashi landed the left, and you could see him let go of the single and limp out, mm-hmm. perfectly fine savage, and we now know that, had it not been stopped, Henderson might have permanent eye damage. So, in retrospect, it's easy to say good stop. It's live. I can see why the fans are complaining because he was able to take him down after Musashi was done fighting. But, um, it's one of those, it's one of those weird fights where you wonder, even if in his prime, because Henderson got dropped a lot in his prime, mm-hmm. would he have made it through that fight? Would they have let that fight go longer if it was four or five years earlier? It's hard to say, but I mean, that was that fight where I worried if Musashi would get too relaxed and get clipped, but he never did. He fought how you should fight Dan Henderson if you're a striker like Gegard Mousasi. Stay on the outside, let Henderson come to you. He will leave himself open because, God damn, he's a little open at right hand. Yeah. So, I mean, Henderson, he's gotten to the point where, I, I don't know, I can't tell you the last time he took anyone down. Um, 
he, he, he's got Chuck Liddell syndrome. He's going to do one thing, try to hit you with the inside leg kick to set up the right hand. Yeah. And people are seeing through that now. He looked awful against Cormier. He looked pretty bad against uh, uh, Wisasi on Saturday. And that was, I mean, his speed looks fine. It doesn't look like he's slowed down. It just looks like he doesn't have, maybe his mystique is gone. Maybe it's just, you know, people know they can beat him and knock it in with the right hand. It's, it's hard to stay with a guy like him. Yeah, I mean, it just seems like he's really dumbed down his style to to, to that yeah. white hand. Fedor, That's what... Fedor did the same thing at the tail end, end of his career. Fedor, in his prime, was very good at mixing the throws, going up and down, leading with different punches. And then, like, you look at the Henderson fight, what was Fedor's strategy? It's just windmill punches, uh, maybe we'll land. And, you know, like, <laughs> That's kind of what Dan Henderson's doing lately, too. Is well, I just throw this over and over again, like it's the UFC video game, one of them will land. And it does <laughs> Uh, uh, what is it? Um, Dan Henderson actually broke a record that you don't want to break after uh, after this fight. He he now holds the record for most knockdowns in in not just UFC, well not UFC, but like in an accumulation of UFC, WEC, Pride, and Strike Force. He holds the record for most knockdowns. <laughs> like like I mean everyone he he has a phenomenal chin, but he's always been susceptible to getting dropped. It's the putting him away that's always been the hard part. The fact that that's gotten easier over the years, and I mean, he has gotten dropped with shots that he wouldn't have gotten dropped with earlier on. Mm-hmm. Age always catches up with you. Mark Hunt, the greatest chin of all, all time, got knocked out by the middleweight, Melvin Manoff, who was before Johnson, the scariest fighter of all time. But I mean, it shows that anyone, if they're in the fight long, long enough, they're going to get knocked out. It's going to happen. Yeah, man, and so I, I didn't have a problem with stoppage either. I heard people calling it early. I kind of wanted to until I saw, like, the slow-mo replays, and you see Dan kind of, when he goes in for that single, he's kind of face-planting a little, <laughs> you know, and uh, it just seems like he was a little, you know, woozy there, and so, uh, um. Musashi looked really good. He's oh, smart. yeah, definitely. If someone who's overly patient, that's the kind of fight where being patient paid off for him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, you gotta be with with a guy like Henderson. Yeah, I didn't think that. You know, that's that's the that's the thing about Gegard. It sucks too, especially for fans that haven't seen him fight before. They're going like, oh, "What is what is it about this guy?" You know, because um, what is it? He's uh, what now three and two in the UFC. Going into this fight, he was only two and two. So I mean, um, but of course the losses are to Leoto and Jacare, two guys vying for title shots right now. So I mean, you can't. I mean, Oh yeah, it was a great fight too. I mean, he 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 uh he held his own against Machida and uh and, and um to me, you know. So I, it was a close fight. I, I believe I had it for Machida. His, his patience and his you know sometimes complete lack of aggressiveness came back to bite him. It was like the same with the King Bo fight when he lost the title there. He was too content to sit on his back, and you know he just never actually put up any offense. He was waiting for the perfect situation too much. Yeah. Um. But I mean, I hope Gig. Uh, who would you like to see Gegard fight next? I'm thinking about that. Oh, he, he fought Jack Ray. He fought Musashi. Jack um, Ray. <laughs> I just like how you said it was kind of funny. He fought Machida. My bad. Uh, I don't know. He, he, didn't he just be? Did he fight CB Dalloway? No, he hasn't fought CB Dalloway. He he, he, he submitted the two the two wins he had is against Alir Fatifi and uh uh. Uh, who is it? Oh, Mark Munoz when he submitted him with a rear naked show. Oh, yeah, 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 that one. Uh, and CB's yeah, fighting Michael Bisping coming up. Had a career resurgence, staying a little more toward the top than he had previously in his career. And, I mean, that's also a fight that could play against Gegard style, who is overly patient, gets on his back. He's great off his back, but you wouldn't know it based off of some fights. He's like, oh, old Aaron Guard. So, I mean, I think that'd be a good fight to see if he's actually up his aggression a bit. Maybe he can counter the takedown a little bit better. I mean, so so was the Munoz fight, but he never let Munoz get off like that. He, he, he kind of picked apart Munoz from the beginning. Yeah, I, that was one of his finer performances in the, in recent years too. Yeah. Um, I, what is it? CB Dalloway's fighting Michael Bisping, uh, one eighty. Oh, perfect winner of that fight. I I completely fine with the winner of that. Fight. Yeah, I mean, because I either Bisping or CB, that's a great fight. I think, especially for Bisping, I think Gegard, that's a perfect matchup for him too. Yeah, because once again. Bisping's another guy who's going to test that overly patient style. Bisping is not. Bisping lets no one rest in any fight ever. Yeah. So that's, that's his weapon, cardio. It's always been one of his yeah. greatest weapons. And that's one of those ones where it's like, you know, something's got to break. It's, 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 
depends on which one. So that that's an intriguing one. And, you know, yeah. you got to wonder how much longer Bisping has left too. But I mean, he doesn't seem to be. He's racking up losses, but it's not like he's slowing down. I think competition is starting to pass him by. Yeah, I mean, it just seems like he's more. He's starting to enter that gatekeeper range. But I'm not gonna. I'm gonna reserve that talk, that kind of talk until you know until he has a performance like where you think he should lose. I mean, he's kind of had that. Who did he lose to recently? Not Tim Kennedy, but oh, Luke Rockhold. But you know, Luke Rockhold's Luke Rockhold. So. I just, Luke Rockhold. Something weird about him. I I've talked to you about this. Something about him that I just don't get. <laughs> the fact that he looks like a surfer and not a fighter, and he just gets in there, he's like, oh, you can kick really hard, okay. Did you hear that guy was on a, a show called Millionaire Matchmaker? Like, overly impressive to me. I don't know, maybe I'm just a stickler, but I still have to be sold on him. Yeah, oh, well, I think he's one of the, he's a really great fighter. I don't think he beats guys like, I don't think he'd win a rematch with Jacare, and I don't think that don't he think beat Wyden. I not think he won Weidman. the first fight, honestly. Huh? I didn't think he won the first fight. I thought he was... That was a close fight, but you know, I, I wasn't judging it, but at the same time I was thinking like I, I felt like he uh he landed more combinations than Jacare did in the in the feet, and so that kinda just woos me into thinking he won. So I I would have to rewatch it. It was a while ago. Yeah, I mean I, I was also watching it from a Jacare fan standpoint, so you know, my, my opinion that that one was biased as well. So. <laughs> yeah, I feel like watching it. I remember watching it thinking it was a great fight, so I might I might just go watch it just for the fun of it on yeah, Fight Pass. Not a bad one. Probably watch it on Fight Pass. Yeah, I'm sure it's there. A lot of great, great Strike Force fights are. And I'm actually at UFC 82 now. I've been watching them all in chronological order since like oh, since a couple months ago, and yeah, it's just kind of taking over me. But I'm, <laughs> um, I think that you know, Gegard, it's it sucks though because like you know having lost the two of the best in the world that have, that have or will fight for the title soon possibly, um. Kind of, uh, you know, but he's only. But what's crazy is he's only twenty nine. He yeah. has he had just as many fight. He still has just as many fights as Dan Henderson, but he's twenty nine. That was really throwing me off. They both going into this fight had forty two fights. And yeah. I'm like, whoa. Well, you know, the sad thing is Dan Henderson's record is starting to couture out a bit. It's starting to become like a two to one win ratio, which doesn't look as good just based on a pure number. Yeah, what is he? He's thirty and thirteen now, right? So uh, yeah, he's yeah, getting. 14, something like that. Yeah, 30, yeah. Like, like, one thing I would say about Couture is that he only won, left, like, you know, three-fifths of his fights or something like that at this point. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, he had, like, a three-fight winning streak going into that Machida fight before he retired, so. I mean, uh, yeah. he kind of yeah, walked yeah. away clean, you know. What? He, he kind of walked away clean, you know, not on a bad streak. Not like if Dan decided well, to retire well, now, it'd be well, kind of bad. It's not like he, you know... He got caught that fight. Could he have won? Sure. But, I mean... Didn't look like he would have. <laughs> he looked like a fool. Yeah, it didn't look like he would have. I remember watching that and thinking, Randy has not cut this guy off. And that's one of the things you really got to pay attention to doing when you're trying to, you know, fight Leoto is cut him off. Weidman did it uh, fairly well in their fight. Um, but, yeah, Couture was just kind of following him off the cage instead of cutting him off, Weidman you know? Was also not 48. That was also... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, good point. But uh, what is it? How old is Couture now? Like fifty? That dude's crazy. He's over. He's over fifty now. I don't think he's. Come, I don't want him to ever come back. Oh no, no, no! I'm not saying he ever would, but just thinking like that fight wasn't that long ago. It was what four years ago, and he's yeah. I think he was forty eight, forty seven. So he's like fifty one or fifty two. That's crazy to think about. He is now fifty one. Yeah. Yeah, that's nuts. <laughs> But also comes the argument is starting at MMA a later age not that bad of a thing. I mean, he, he fought to be 47, he didn't debut to be like 37 or 39, something along the lines of that. Oh, so I thought he was like 32 or 33. Like, he debuted at UFC uh, 19, right? Yeah, um, but I mean, even then, he just, I mean, he debuted at a much older age than a lot of kids. Oh, yeah. Coming in 18, but see, the thing about Randy. Yeah, see, the thing about Randy was that he was just always in shape, no matter what, throughout all of his all of his life up till that point. And in the sense, like he was a boxer in the army, and he was like an Olympic alternate, I believe. Um, and so when you're that kind of an athlete, you're just always in great shape. And of course, by the time he was 32, 33, which is the age I think he debuted at, but I could be wrong. Thirty three or thirty four. Yeah, something like that. By the time he was that age, he hadn't taken any damage, you know. I mean, like not like in a fight, fight. I, 
you know, so as far as I know, I think he was just he had a clean bill, really clean bill of health before even going into mixed martial arts. And he was in the Golden Gloves, but the Golden Gloves is, is different than the high level pro boxing. Oh yeah, I mean, sports, yeah, so. yeah. And so by then, I think he was just at a at a at a at a, at a, at a green area in health yeah. uh, going into it, and you know, uh, he hadn't you know gone through too, especially because if he was an Olympic alternate, which I'm just kind of guessing because I think that's what he was, but I could be wrong. But just thinking that he was, uh, you, 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 I think that when you, uh, when you're, you're older, like in the thir- mid thirties, which is kind of like old for MMA now. I think when you're a, an Olympic athlete, Olympic level athlete, or trying to be, you know, or, or, or trained to be, or to be in that kind of, I think you know, it's not the same for you as opposed to like somebody else that's just coming up at a young age and just starts doing mixed martial arts off the bat. Especially then, because you know, when you're a kid and you're doing MMA, and then you get into it in your young age, and then you're thirty some, thirty two, thirty some, you've actually taken some punishment by then, you know. Um, I mean, Vandalay and Shogun are prime examples of that. They, it, yeah, you know, definitely. So yeah. Twenty, and then when they're the physical prime, their body's already breaking down. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was talking about this with uh, with with uh, Jonas about Yoel Romero because he's like thirty seven now. But because he's been in the Olympics and he's trained his body, you know, since a young age to just be at at, at, the, at its physical peak, you know, he he's uh he's one of those you know exclusions from that kind of list where you're thinking, oh, he's in his 30s, he's too old to be doing this. You know, he's not, not really. I mean, he's only at, and I think he's only at, he's what, was he 14 now right now? He's not even been beaten yet either. So. And the thing is, like, he comes from a grappling background where, like, you know, I do know jiu jitsu, judo. A little bit more physical. Judah's a little, a lot more aggressive toward, you know. Oh yeah. Getting thrown on yeah, your back is not fun. Not <laughs> destroys your body like kickboxing, boxing, or training MMA all that time does. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's, it's one that your body can easily recover from and be fresh still. So if any base like wrestling and and, and grappling, not a bad place to go if you're coming in old. Yeah. And so yeah, like I said, him and Randy back then at uh, the time were not bad. And, and I, I don't know about Hendo, but I believe he was. In his late twenties when he started, right? Uh, it's something fun. like that. Cause, I mean, everyone wants to say he never won a UFC title. Technically, he won the UFC 17 tournament, so I'll give him that much. Yeah. But uh, yeah, and, he was, and, his, and he's won a lot of other belts anyway. He won the Strike Force yeah. Pride Belt. You know, he's had a great yeah. career. So if he did retire now, he started at uh 27 years old. 27, and he's 42 yeah. now. Oh, okay. 44. So 20, he's 44. Oh shit. Yeah. So that's what four, uh, fourteen year career, wow. Or no, seventeen year career. Yeah. A lot of people say the staying on his career is never won the UFC belt. Mine's that he never defended a single title he ever won. Not, he never attempted a title defense of any title he. I ever thought he won. defended the Strike Force belt, did he not? No, he won the Strike Force belt, belt, fought Fedor and left. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And he won the the. Uh, uh, welterweight Grand Prix belt, which became the welterweight championship, never defended that. Won the middleweight championship belt, and then Pride was so he never defended that either. Yeah, he, he literally never defended the title, never attempted a defense. Oh, uh, well, way to dumb down his career. All right. <laughs> if, if there's any criticism I have for his career, it's that it's not that he hasn't won a UFC title, but he won Pride. Pride at the time was tougher than the UFC. We yeah. talked about this more than enough, but um. Yeah, I just would have liked him. To, I mean, because he, he lost as a champion. He lost as the welterweight champion in the next welterweight tournament. So it also tarnishes that title run as well. But, I mean, that's all getting into stuff that really doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, as far as what Dan, what's up for Dan next, I think that he's uh, he's kind of been on this list where it should be just about money fights. He's going to continue fighting. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's just – uh. For me, a rampage rematch, maybe I don't know. Yeah, I was just thinking that a rampage rematch, possibly. The first fight was pretty. Their first fight was not a bad fight. It was kind of a. No, nah, it was at UFC seventy in England. A lot of down moments too. Yeah, UFC seventy five. I just recently watched it. it was, yeah, it was fun. I liked it, and especially, um, uh, you know, Hendo started off pretty strong, and and I believe won the first round in my opinion, and then uh, after yeah. that, Rampage just kind of picked it up from there. Um, that fight made me re- uh, respect Rampage. Like yeah, he did. I mean, because he ate game. some shots. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it makes it made the Vandalay KOs back in the day a lot more impressive too. Oh yeah, man! I just uh, recently uh, um, watched uh, some Pride videos as well. Every now and again, when I just want to slow down the UFC 
stuff. I, I watched some of the Pride uh, videos and recently just watched the first Pride, uh, first Vanderlei Rampage fight. So, man. Oh, the, the 17 straight knee strikes. Yeah. <laughs> Brutal, man. I, I love it, though, man. I mean, watching Vanderlei, uh, you know, uh, if there ever comes a point where I just kind of need to stop watching these, I'm just going to start dumbing through all of the Pride videos and, and I might skip a few just to watch Vanderlei fight. Because, man, back in the day, I mean, God, you, you could not have been more excited for a Vanderlei card coming up when in the present time back then. You know, just because, uh, you know, just just clicking on some of these videos of the fights that he's going to have uh, or that he has on there and that I'm about to watch and I'm just getting giddy. You know? <laughs> It's, yeah. fun, it's fun watching that dude fight back in the day. Like Pride, a lot of people insult Pride for having like fights that made no sense. Like, why is Vanderlei fighting this judo guy that two professional fights? But sometimes it's fun to watch a champion just beat the absolute ever loving shit about somebody who doesn't deserve to be in there and look like a fucking badass doing it. Yeah. I enjoy it every time of time. Yeah, I mean, the UFC's doing that now, so you know, they, they do those fun fights, and there's nothing wrong with them. Like, this weekend, we have a fun fight coming up, Silva and Diaz, that's a fun fight. That's not like a – it shouldn't be. According to Dana, Silva might get a title shot off of uh, off of Diaz, which I think is nonsense. Yeah. Um, um, yeah even – Yeah, and, and what you know what, what came out today was – even Silva himself said, nah, I need a few more fights after this fight for before I fight for the title again, which, you know, is, is good on his part to say. Um, so I, I like that he said that. He walked away to being champion anymore. I think, he's, I think he's like, okay, I had it for long enough. Someone else take that shit. I'm just going to sit back here and fight. Yeah. Uh, yeah, especially with fights like this. Like that's what I'm saying. Money fights, man. He's gonna fight Diaz this weekend. Guarantee you, he makes some good bank. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that this card's gonna do really good. A lot of people are hyped for it. It's all I hear about now that the, now that the Fox card's done. Um, even before this Fox card, I was hearing more about that card than this one. Uh, this last one. Uh, just now. So. The undercard is of that fight. All I know is that Silva's fighting Diaz, and that's really all that matters. Oh, uh, let's look it up. Uh, I no, I think the main card looks great. First of all, in the co-main, you got KG Kelvin Gastelum versus uh Tyron Woodley in the co-main. You have Lozon versus Ally Aquinto, who recently has just looked uh awesome as of late. Um, and then uh, what is it? You have Talis Ladies Tim Bosch, I believe. That's a good fight, especially with how Talis uh, Ladies has looked recently. Ever since coming back to the UFC, he's looked great. Let's see. I'm looking it up right now. Yeah, but this is I'm looking it up now. It's clearly one of those fights. It's a it's a one fight card. You're buying this card to see one fight. Well, yeah, I mean, because like a lot of the guys don't have big names, you're right? Um, I mean, everyone who's an MMA fan absolutely loves watching Joe Lozon fight. Oh but yeah. If it was headlining a pay per view, those numbers would be so. Even if he was co it wouldn't be that special. Tyron Woodley. And he's, he's hit or miss. Well, they're ranked, you know, so it makes, it makes a big... Uh... Oh, Jordan Mean, Tiago Alves. That's another great fight. Yeah. Uh, oh, Misha okay. Tate, Sarah McMahon headlining the prelims, which I think is kind of weird, but... Misha Tate just needs to shut him out. <laughs> you don't like Misha Tate? She's missing, a little missing title, I'm sick of it. She's misentitled? Yeah. What does that mean? No, she's a little misentitled. She's she feels like she's entitled to every bit of credit that people don't give to her. Like shut up, fight. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Ian McCall, John Lineker, supposedly the winner of this gets Johnson next for the title. Of course, the the the, the eliminator fights on the prelim. Yeah, that's kind of silly, right? Um, why wouldn't this headline the prelims? They're ranked more than like six or seven fighters above them. You know, and that, I wouldn't mind that being the opening fight of the pay per view. That, that's an yeah, that's what it should be. Like Jordan Mean, Alves, guys like those who need to be viewed more, a little more, especially with Alves coming back from a long layoff of, from injury, and Jordan Mean still trying to make a name for himself. I mean, you know, some good fans know about him, but you know. Yeah. Do you say put them on the free TV? And, yeah, that's not a bad idea. Yeah, I mean, I understand why Misha Tate and Sarah McMahon headlines the prelims, but when you got names like Mean and Alves and and Ian Brandao and Hedis, and well, they're on the prelims, but you know, like uh, just thinking about how uh, you know neither of those guys are ranked, and you have Ian McCall ranked like number five or something, and John Lineker number four, um, then then those are the guys that should take precedence, especially when a title fight is on the line. I mean, I, I understand that, you know, that, that being on the prelims, they might get viewed by more people. Um, but it just seems like it's less important it, if it's on the prelims, you know, especially when a title uh, title implications are on the line, you know. 
So it just seems weird. I, I just think that's poor placement of, of that fight on this card. Um, but has he made weight two fights in a row? John Lineker, I do not. I know he made weight his last fight. I don't think he made weight the last one. So. Uh, well, it looks like he made it against Bagu Dino because nothing said in the notes that it was a catch weight. So I mean, if he's made two in a row, that's that's impressive. Uh, he wait said he made weight against Bogatinov. No, well, it's not saying he missed weight. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. And then yeah, he made weight against the uh, Optican Ocelist, or however you say his name, and then he uh, beat really? him. Yeah, God bless you. <laughs> yeah, so he's. It seems like he's he's getting that going. He's finally figuring that out. What's crazy is that you know, like he made he missed weight so many times. And then when Henry Cejudo misses weight once, they just say, no, no more. But apparently, Henry Cejudo will get that shot again. This card looks great, though, to me. I think, like, for me, for a fan that knows all of these guys and knows what they bring to the table, I'm freaking amped. But, of course, all of your nonchalant fans that, are, that you know, don't watch as often as we do um, would probably, yeah, are buying this just for the main event, for sure. Um, but me, I think this is going to turn out to be a great card. It, it kind of needs to at this point. It's, whenever they have a, a one a one match pay per view like this one, they need the card as a whole to be great because they need to build fighters off of these cards. Oh, and definitely. They, they, have to, they have seemed to have waned away from pay per view a bit, doing a lot more free cards than pay per view cards. Yeah. You you could argue that's watering down this that yada yada, but I don't they, think that's the case here though. Trying to make stars this time. As opposed to the last two or three years where they've just been sitting on their laurels and stuff like that, mm -hmm. they're trying to pump people. And and I, I from a perspective, from you know, from a business side, I, I respect that. Yeah, I yeah, but for me, I just think that this card is going to be great. Uh, as far as everybody on the card knowing what they brought to the table, how good they are, especially ladies. I mean, he's like, uh, if I have to look at the main card other than the main event and say who I'm most interested in seeing, I actually have to say Talos Ladies. And five years ago, who would think I'd be saying that? But yeah, he since uh, coming back. I mean, he's like on a three fight win streak. Let me see. I think he's on a he's, he's on a four fight win streak on every fight. And yeah. Uh. Well, I mean, in just in the UFC. What the hell is that? What's up? Why does he have two wins by TKO? That's just yeah. That's great. No, he knocked out Cron Francis Carmon his last fight. I remember that. And then Trevor Smith, the fight before that. And then he came into the UFC fighting Tom. Who fight in between them? Oh, Ed Herman. But the, his first fight back in the UFC at UFC one sixty three two years ago. Uh, that that got fight of the night. I was like, whoa! When did this guy decide to you know stay in the pocket and actually get a, some boxing uh, going? You know, he uh, he hung in there with Tom Watson and and uh, and beat him uh, on the ground and then hung with them standing and was able to get the decision. And uh, I I was thinking like, whoa! He's gotten way better. He's I mean, it, in this close fight, he's never looked better to me. Yeah. So for me, I just. No. You can look at the uh, Marquardt fight as one of those ones where he kind of busted out, but also Marquardt got deducted to shit for, I think, illegal knees, and I think grabbing the cage was what he got before that fight, but, I mean, yeah, there's that fight. I mean, everyone still has that stain of the Anderson Silva fight where he literally just Aoki butts dude the entire fight. I mean, that's slowly going away as he keeps on putting on these fights that make you, where the hell is this been? Yeah, four fights in, and now he's fighting Tim Bosch, a ranked opponent, and I think he's like ranked 15, Tim, or not uh, Tim, I think Tim Bosch is like somewhere 11 through 15, but tr ladies is 15, yeah. and this is a big fight for him, especially if he wins five in a row, and then and, and if he can get another finish, it would be crazy, He's got, he's gotten two finishes since he's returned, and by knockout, which is insane, because I don't think, I don't remember a time he ever got a knockout uh, in his first tenure in the, in the UFC, um, I don't think he did. He was one of those guys who was seen as, uh, if he gets you down, you're in trouble, but you can stand with this guy. Clearly, now... Not the case. Yeah, your point. <laughs> yeah. What's crazy is we've actually gotten away from the CFC on Fox card, but, but uh, like, uh, Ryan Bader and uh, Phil Davis, what did you think of that fight? I'm kind of glad we avoided that whole fight. Count. <laughs> well, how did you score it then? We'll just go with that. Uh, that no one should win. <laughs> I actually thought it was a competitive fight. I mean, it was back and forth in the sense that you know they were really trying. They, it, it was it was more of like a um it was a weird kind of fight. Yeah, I thought it was competitive and, and 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 at least intriguing to watch. Maybe not exciting, but uh, I, but you're just, I was sitting there thinking like, whoa. Oh, well, main also because you know I do MMA fantasy, so I was hoping that Phil would win. Thinking yeah. like, oh come on, get yeah, this last know. round. <laughs> So, it's a close fight, but it's also a fight where you spend a lot of time looking at your phone. 
No, I didn't look at my phone. Good. Got to keep the vibe of what's going on. Oh, you know, uh, Davis isn't getting the state down. Oh, and gotcha. Bader's a whole top position with the headlock. All right, what's going on on Twitter? That's kind of like, you know, the mindset you get when a fight kind of gets in a pattern like that. Yeah. And there's just not really a lot going on. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Well, with, with Bader winning this fight, who do you think he fights next? And it's weird because, like, um, I, I – think he's hitting that gatekeeper status, but it does seem like he's getting a little better. I thought his hands looked better in this fight than they've had in the last few years. Um, Who does Shogun have lined up? He doesn't have anybody lined up. You think that fight makes That's sense? That's kind of the fight I've been wanting for Shogun for a while, because if he can't beat Ryan Bader, god damn, get out of the sport. <laughs> <laughs> for, for a guy that makes sense, talented actually. And, and is legendary as Shogun, nothing against Bader, but if he can't beat that guy, he can't, I mean, he's done. Yeah. Well... Uh, yeah, Shogun uh, is gonna film the Ultimate Fighter in Brazil uh, this in, in the like in a month or so after because after Silva fights uh, Diaz, he's supposed to go film that in Brazil. Um, yeah, and then the, and then both Silva and yeah, and then both Silva and who are supposed to get different opponents. Bader sounds like a, a, a opponent that makes sense if he's willing to wait that long because I think that might be that might be like a three month stretch he'd have to wait. Um, yeah, I mean. For me, just as a Shogun fan, I've been saying this ever since the Dan Henderson fight. He needs to fight Vader. That's Vader is kind of like what uh, Joe Stevenson was back in the day. If you can beat him, you're up with the top guy still. If you can't beat him, you got to start rethinking and stuff. In, in, a level, in a way, that's what Bisping is right now. If you can beat Bisping, you're one on top. If you can't beat Bisping, it's back to the drawing board. And, and Shogun's running out of boards to draw. That's that's more so the case for Bisping than anybody else. I think Bisping, uh, of all his wins, only two or three of them, if that, um, and he's got a lot. He's got like 15 wins, but like two or three of them are are still are only still signed in the UFC right now, and that's yeah. you know yeah. that that kind of says a lot. I don't know what the what the case is about Bader, um, uh, but yeah, I mean a lot of the people he does beat don't generally get above him. Uh, much after that, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, like guys like Keith I mean, Dardine or Eric uh, or was, Eric Schaefer. Say it again. So that's exactly the guy I was thinking of was Jardine. When I ever think Ryan Bader, I think of his win against his wins against Jardine, wins against Matthew Shanko, guys like that who just they're not around anymore. Sure, they're they're solid names, but they're not around anymore. Oh God, he's on a four fight win streak. Who? Oh. Who is? Oh, Bader? Yeah, he's beaten, like, what? Anthony Paroche, uh, OSP, who just beat Phil. Who, did, who else did he fight? Uh, Bejao. He beat... Oh, that's right. Oh, that was a horrible fight, though. <laughs> that's, the, that's the problem with Bader, dude. He, he's, if he's not knocking you out, he's laying on you. And he's not really aggressive with his ground. Apart. Yeah, that was also the... Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking in that Paroche fight, like, man, he, he should have... I mean, he broke his hand, so I guess there there's that. But yeah, in that Paroche fight, man, I mean, he beat him up to a 30-25 or something like that to the point where yeah. you're thinking, like, man, you should have finished that guy. He gave you not much at all uh, in that fight. If he just amped it up just a little more, I'm sure he could have gotten finished. And then in the OSP fight, it was just the same deal but for two more rounds but without us, but with less aggression. So it, it, was, it wasn't that fun to watch. Neither was the phase out. The, the – um, and now he's got this Phil Davis fight, which I think out of all four of them is probably the most – was the most intriguing to watch. And I say yeah, intriguing because I mean, Phil made it a fight at least. You know what I mean? Those yeah, last three guys it, didn't. But not really fun. And in, in, in a day where you got to market yourself with not only your, your personality but your propensity to put on exciting fights, he doesn't come up with the exciting fight department. His most exciting fights are against Teixeira and Machida where he got knocked out. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, and then early on, before any losses, he had some. He had an exciting striking style. He wasn't as afraid to strike with guys, you know. And that's the thing is that like. Fighter, I think he won that with like two knockouts, and then he had the knockout of Vinny, the knockout of Jardine, knockout of uh, Eric Schaefer, I believe. Did he knock out Eric Schaefer? No, I don't know. That one wasn't. He was close in the second round, um, but he didn't put him away. I kind of want to look at his record now. I want to see who he used to. Right now, he's 19 and 4. I do remember the Schaefer fight. That was on the, with the first show on the Cheetah Guard. There mm-hmm. were a couple of times I thought he had him, but especially in the second round, he, he hurt him bad with punches. And the other one was a diving right hand that I thought was going to put it away, but he just Schaefer was tough, I guess. It's been a while since he's seen Yeah, he knocked out Schaefer. Jason Brills 
after uh, a loss to Tito at 132. Oh, I remember that fight. That was a hilarious knockout. He's kind of like jabbed him when he's like, you know, kind of drunk. Yeah, and then Brill's like, just slow motion. <laughs> you know, yeah, it was kind of similar to the way that, that Henderson fell backwards, like stumble, 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 and you're like, this isn't there anymore. Yeah. Yeah, Bader's, man, that's weird that, you know, he's just, uh, yeah, he's just kind of, he's, he, even in winning, he just seems to be on this weird slump. <laughs> like, you know, it's kind of funny. Yeah. It's wins that don't put him out there. And I mean, I think the Phil Davis puts the Phil Davis win does put him out there. Like, whoa, okay, so you know he beat a, a highly ranked guy, a highly skilled guy. Um, and he did a good job with a guy who's known for being an explosive wrestler as tough to stop. Yeah, I mean, uh, especially because I honestly thought Phil Davis he was more athletically sound. So I, and I, I figured he was a strong figure. He'd be able to hang with Bader and and actually beat him in, in the wrestling department, but. Uh, I, yeah. I still feel it was like more of a stalemate there. I thought he would possibly get him a submission because, I mean, even though Davis hasn't finished anyone in a long time, those arms, it, it's easy to lock up or easier for a guy like him to lock up those arm submissions, the arm triangles, the anacondas, all that kind of stuff, the bravo chokes. Yeah, I I, I thought that uh, Davis would get the submission. I think Bader's more I, – I thought, yeah, just because Davis being the way that he's been lately – it just seems like he had – and I don't even – Davis is one of these guys where I don't feel like he's really filled out his, his potential at all by any means. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I feel like he, he has so much that he could still learn and, and, and add to his game, especially in the striking department. Um, it doesn't even have – and I, a lot, I hear a lot of people tell me he doesn't like to be hit. Um, it, it's – you know, nobody likes to get hit. He just doesn't react well to getting hit. Um, but I just see the, for his frame – he he just has like he he looks like a really really clean canvas where you could just really yeah. you know if he's devoted like a good year to just striking you know because his grappling's there I mean it, it maybe it needs to get a little better so I add that in but he just really needs to devote a lot of great time to striking now. Um, Do you remember that that little thing he had where apparently his wife said he was like pseudo raping her or something like that? Or oh like, yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that he hasn't been the same. I feel like that was the turning point. Cause I feel like after that was the, I feel like that was between uh before the Vinny Maglash fight, and he didn't look bad in it, but he didn't look good. And ever since then, he just hasn't looked good in really any fight. Even the Machida fight, a lot he didn't look great. He won. It was a contested decision, and a lot of people don't think he won, but he didn't look, look good. He that's when he started to become a little overly content with holding. Yeah. What? Did, um. Oh, excuse me. Hold on. <coughs> Jeez. God bless. <laughs> oh, God thanks. bless you. Thanks. Um, but yeah, I feel like um, yeah, he he he. First of all, he's gotten less aggressive in there, even yeah. with his wrestling. You know, like if you watch the Tim Bosch fight, that's easily his finest performance because he was throwing that dude around and he was making it like a, a you know, he was making it a point to to go after the guy. You know what I mean? To really go after him in the sense where he was just aggressive, coming forward. Put in pressure. He's not that kind of guy. Uh, I mean, most he's, recently, he's a Gustafson and Stan too, and it's just ever since then, it's just something isn't there. And I feel like his after his wife said, "Yo, this guy's a little bit uh, a little bit too on the up and up with his dick in my ass or something." Like that. <laughs> yeah, it's it seems like it, it, it with him. It's got to be a mental thing. Yeah, and and but at, at the same time, I don't feel like his skill set is is improving at all. <laughs> Probably part of the mental thing. I don't know where he's training yet. Um, couldn't play off the top of my head. I'm looking up. Right oh well, now. as far as I know, he's he sticks at, uh, at Alliance MMA, but um, um, he also had that thing where team where he was very close to team or to Lloyd Irvin, and then Lloyd Irvin went through that whole yeah that whole Lloyd Lloyd Irvin incident. Uh, and also, he hasn't since he left either. It's you know, I don't know how much he had. To, I don't know much how much Lloyd Irvin had to do in his career, but he hasn't had a submission since Lloyd Irvin left. Yeah, it's weird. And well, I mean, Lloyd Irvin was one of the grappling coaches there, no? Yeah, like, he, he one of the prime a, ones there. Oh, wow. He was always in his corner, you know. Yeah, but I mean, I was actually talking to my instructor Jeff Jeff Curran about uh, Lloyd Irvin one time, and he's like, "I fucking hate the guy." I'm like, "Why?" It's because what he did is like, "No, because he's a fucking pony." He'll just pay people who already accomplished other skills and they'll slap his logo on them 
and they'll go out and they'll represent his gym, even though there's no Lloyd Irvin style. Lloyd Irvin was just a businessman who would find the guys who were just about to break out, slap his logo on them, and put them out there. That was coming from my coach. I, is that true? I don't know. That's just his opinion on him. But, mm-hmm. I mean, that also makes me question Lloyd Irvin's impact. Is he a good coach? I don't know. I never trained with the guy. So, I can't say. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, well, I mean, we'll see where Phil Davis goes from here. I mean, uh, he, he's not out of out of the game uh, by any means. Losing to Johnson, Johnson uh, I totally got. <laughs> but losing to Bader uh, is not a good loss. You know, you really need – he really needs to pick himself up from here. And I really think – he switching camps might be the best deal for him. I know, I, you know, Alliance is a great gym, but not every gym's for everybody. You know what I mean? Sometimes you really need you need a you really need to switch things up. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing that. I think that he need, he definitely needs to train uh, like train somewhere else and, and maybe get a, a a different perspective on 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 his skill set, a fresh set of eyes watching him. Uh, you know, uh, breaking down. What I want for him is to see him fight someone that he should roll over quickly and beat easily. I want to see him, like, like when he fought Wagner Prado, he rolled over him and beat him easily. I want to see him in one of those fights. Because if he doesn't do that, then we've got some serious problems. Yeah. If he's positioning some guy, he should be stopping in two rounds. So that's the kind of one of those times where I want to see him in a showcase fight. See what he, if, he, if it is mental or if it is physical or what it is. Sometimes in fights like that, it's easier to see, okay, maybe he just doesn't have it against the top yet, or there's something deeper than his training and his fighting ability. I think if Fabio's Fabio Maldonado makes sense to me, I know he's fighting Quentin Rampage yeah, Jackson yeah. next. Uh, if he beats Qu- Rampage, I don't, I, uh, then not him. But if he loses to Quentin, then I, I wouldn't mind seeing him and Fabio, yeah. especially because that makes sense. Fabio has like a four-fight winning streak. Like well, right even, now. If, even if Rampage loses, why not have him against Rampage? He would Rampage had this day and age against a wrestler, and Rampage hates wrestlers, so... Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, I, that would be a good fight. You could put, like, on a fight night card, definitely. Ramp, Rampage and Phil. Uh, just having Rampage there really amps it up. But, uh... What's up? So if you put that as, like, a co-main event of a box card, that'll get eyes tuned in. Yeah, especially because a lot of people would be, you know, be, be looking in on, okay, where is he at? Let's see where he's at. At least I would, you know. Well, a lot of people probably don't know that he was in a different promotion. I mean, a lot of people who watch UFC may not know that Bellator exists. So when he was gone, they might, not have, they might just, you know, been like, oh, that Rampage guy, he hasn't been around for a while. I wonder what he's up to. And then watch him fight and see what he's got. Yeah, it's definitely going to be interesting. Oh, especially, yeah, that works out for Phil in that sense. Um, I'm, yeah, we'll see where Phil goes. Like I was saying, I think a, a new change of scenery is the way to go right now to see. see well, I mean, I don't know what his critique is on that fight. But it, it, my critique of him in the last couple of years is that he's just not improved, and I think you yeah. know, um, I think it's just time to get a, a a fresh coach looking at you, seeing what it is you got, um, seeing where it is you need to improve. In my opinion, it's the striking game, especially even though I believe that his that he he has so much potential in that department. He's already a great grappler, um, but I just feel like man, he he could do so much uh, more. Uh, in, in that you know, in the sense that he could really develop a good kickboxing style. He's he's yeah. really he's got great dexterity in his legs. He's 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 already good at you know mixing it up with leg kicks, body kicks, head kicks, and stuff. He just uh, he really needs to put combinations together much uh, uh, better. Um, Slip down on his strikes, get some power around them. Yeah, and then uh, you know his and he's also got to learn a better defense as well. Yeah. You know, um, because he was letting Bader hit him in shots that if he had just kept his hands up, he wouldn't have gotten hit with. You know what I mean? <clears throat> but we'll move on from this card. We were talking about 183 too, and uh, I, I want to know what your opinions on this Anderson Silva Nick Diaz fight is. Uh, that's one of those fights where I mean, I don't think anyone should get a title fight off of any kind of result in a fight like this. It's a, it's an interdivisional oh, no. fight because I still think of the Diaz as a welterweight, Silva's obviously middleweight. With middleweight may go up to slight heavyweight. We don't know. Um. That's one of those fights that a fight fan should just stop bitching about and just sit back and enjoy. Uh, That's what I think. I mean, like we can we can say you know this style versus that style, blah blah. And you know, it's about and, and Silva's answer. Just sit back and enjoy the damn fight. We don't get fights like this often, so why not just, yeah. you know, sit back and take it in? That's what I that's what I think the EFC could do more with is is these is these money fights. Not not because I mean they've always. They've always tried to hold this aura of oh, only the best in the world are here. 
I don't think that that's the case anymore. <laughs> and if they still say that only the best in the world are here, they're, they're kidding themselves. You don't have 500 fighters under your promotion and say all of them are the best in the world. <laughs> it's just not the case. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so I, I just think, you know, it's time, you know, take some of that pride essence and just put on these crazy fights that sometimes don't make any sense. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, I mean, I, I, at front, from my perspective, no, I'll go ahead. So both these guys are coming off two losses, and they're highlighting a pay-per-view that everyone's excited about. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's just about their style. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That oh, that's that's like the <laughs> you just saying that just makes it like the true essence of pride because they're a guy on a four-fight losing streak could fight for a title in pride at times. You know, it's uh. Yeah, well, they they, they love their Japanese guys over in Japan. Let me tell you that. Oh, definitely. They like Trump. I think Pro wrestlers say, "Hey, Vandalay, stop him in the face." Oh shit, he didn't win. Shout out another one. Oh, he got stopped in the face too. Fuck, he had no one left. Out of the prize style. Oh right? man, yeah, man. I it's so it's just crazy. Uh yeah. I mean, for me, this this is a great fight, and I think it, and it, and I think that if it's successful, UFC will take a, will take a take a hint here and say, okay, well, yeah, I mean, fights like Silva Rampage or Rampage or Davis money fights, you know, my, especially like say, um, uh, like uh, if if Silva wanted to fight anybody else at light heavyweight, I don't see what the big deal would be, um, you know, and I think that, uh, I don't know if that's where he plans on spending the rest of his career, uh, like intervaling in and out between middleweight and light heavyweight, or just staying at middleweight and trying to make a run, because I mean. We don't. We still don't get the gist of what Silva really wants out of the rest of his career. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just all like wait and see. Down. What's up? He seems, he seems intent on uh, finishing out the ten fights on his contract. Will that happen? I hope not. Um, why? Why do you hope not? I do. <laughs> I would love to see him fight ten times. Oh, never mind. Uh, he he signed a fifteen fight. <laughs> why wouldn't you want to see him finish that out though? I mean, unless he's getting more fights for a guy who's thirty eight. But it's for Anderson Silva, I think. You know him being at him. You know he's not been in too many bad fights where he's gotten hurt a lot. You know. Um, yeah, but he's getting hurt a lot easier now. Yeah, I mean we'll see. I mean, I, I mean it's just that as it goes, I would love to see him go through ten fights and and just uh and, and come out clean. But uh, you know, if, if that'll happen, who knows? That doesn't mean I hope for it. But it's just like, see, it's, yeah. it's just one of those things where I don't see why anybody needs to say I hope not. For a guy who's one of the funnest dudes to watch ever in MMA history, yeah, and he's I one of the I'm best. That, I guess I'm saying that, assuming that his skill set will continue to deteriorate, I shouldn't make that judgment. But I mean, I mean, I mean, he's lost a half a step in the cage, and that's what got him knocked out against Chris Weidman with a half a step. Yeah, if he's taking a half step, by the way, he wouldn't have gotten hit. So I mean, yeah, I mean, who's to say his skill set is really even diminished? You know what I mean? Um, I. Uh, obviously, in the Weidman fight, I do believe he didn't win a single round against him. But uh, I, you know, I, you know, Weidman's a champ and is a proven guy to be really a, uh, to be a, uh, he could be a proven champion someday. And I, I think that will tell more about you know yeah. how Silva's skill really hasn't diminished. You know what I mean? And uh, so I think you know if his skills do diminish and he's just getting knocked out left and right, like if he starts getting on the Hendo train here. Then yeah, you know yeah. it would suck to see him you know, kind of ruin a career like that. I mean, that's the only yeah. thing about seeing a guy like Hendo go through what he's going through is because you know he's had such a great career. Uh, if he wants to keep fighting, make his money, I'll support him. I'm a fan of his, so I'll always watch and, and be excited for his fights. Um, and it's about like Henderson versus like Vidal or Vanderlei. It's, his knockouts haven't been like brutal. Even like the the head kick knockout against Vitor. He kind of came straight back up off that. He was knocked out for sure. He was completely unconscious. But, like, this knockout wasn't terrible. It's, you know, he's taking a lot of damage in his career. We're talking about Hendo. That's something that we don't talk about with Anderson Silva. So, it's not that you take on a case-by-case -case basis. It's just tough. Yeah. I, for me, I, I, if he, you know, win or lose, I always want to see him fight. I'm just one of those fans that just loves to see him fight. If he ever decides to walk away – Good for him, you know, and I'm sure he's made a lot of money. Another thing that I've heard, and I spoke about this on the last podcast, but here's another thing that kind of irks me, is when people say um, he's made enough money. No, <laughs> that's kind of silly to say. Nobody ever wants to be told how much money if they've made enough money, ever. 
like you for your job, if you made like 10 times more money than you're making right now and, um, and you know, you were making all this money, you're getting millions and, uh, yeah, it was, it was hurt. Like you go home, you're hurt. It, it's like, it irks you, but then you get better and then you keep going to work and then you keep making those millions, you know, um, well, and people say, oh, you made enough money and nobody ever will say, oh, I've made enough money. I don't think. Yeah. You know, especially in MMA. I mean, it, let's be real. It doesn't get they don't they don't all get paid what they deserve for sure. So, with that being said, I just don't. I just think that's always been a weird argument. Yeah, and the sponsors are gone now, so another source of income is, is gone. Yeah, I hope we get to see how this how this like, trickle down to the fighters. But I mean, yeah, like GSP made a lot of money from under Trump. I'm sure, uh, and still made a lot of money from Nike. You don't have that outlet. You don't have those resi- that residual money or that. The, the free equipment coming in or whatever you get from those sponsors, that, that's gone. So. Yeah. I hope Reebok gives out free equipment and gives them a decent pay. I know this tier system coming out. Say that again? I'm sure you read through what the Reebok deal and the equipment and stuff. I didn't read through all of it, <laughs> admittedly. I just well, know that I, I've seen examples of, like, how these guys will be able to customize their uh, their their apparel how they're how you know when, whenever Reebok sells something with their name on it they can design it however they want so long as there's not a sponsor logo or something on it um, yeah and they, they're going to be given Reebok equipment to train with every time they're on like a UFC countdown show the weigh in <laughs> any kind of prep they're going to be wearing Reebok stuff and they're going to be given Reebok gear to wear they're going to be given certain Reebok gear to um, they're going to be given options of what they want to wear if they're not like a big name fighter and have their own like exclusive Reebok. So here's the John Jones line. Um, so there's, there's, from what I read, as long as it sticks to what the, pre- the, the, the press release said, they're going to be given equipment, they're going to be given clothing, and they will be getting a portion of all their you know shirts sold and all that. But obviously, Akira Khorasani is not going to be selling what John Jones sells. Mm-hmm. Akira Khorasani actually um, retired following this about this. Yeah. That's sad, but uh. That was a bad knockout. I mean, he did. He did the whole unconscious, still throwing a punch fall. That's always funny to watch. But man, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, just for for that, you know, good luck to Akira for all of for everything he's uh, you know, for his future endeavors and all that such. I mean, uh, yeah, he he, he, he put on some fun fights, right? huh? That he's made enough money in his career. <laughs> He's met, I mean, he, he put on some fun fights, so, you know, I just, uh, you know, I hope moving forward he's able to take care of himself and all that, and uh, I, I would think, you know, say that again? Open the door for him. Maybe be like a coach in Sweden, open up an MMA gym there that, you know. Get, yeah, possibly. He's obviously well liked there. We can use his name, open up a gym, train some kids, become a coach, become just a, or just a, a specific area trainer, you know. A lot of people coming out of MMA, they have outlets other than fighting that they can use their skills for. So hopefully he goes along that path if he wants to stay involved. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I got to believe that maybe he felt he was taking too much damage or something. Like there, well, that's fight after the Ultimate Fighter has been a knockout loss for him, and that's not a good sign. No, I believe he won three straight and then lost the last three. Uh. He 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 beat Andy Ogle after making his debut because of a bunch of injuries, and then he beat uh, a guy by DQ, so it wasn't really a win. And then, uh, oh, oh Maximo, right. yeah, Maximo Blanco by DQ, and then he beat somebody else legitimately. But oh, uh, Robbie Peralta, which I was upset yeah. about that. <laughs> yeah, is Maximo still around? Or yeah, I don't know what happened to him after that fight. I don't. That may have been his last fight. Oh, he beat a guy named Dan Hooker. Dan Hooker. Yeah, in the in the the Mark Hunt uh, Roy Nelson card. Uh, really? I watched yeah, that card. I don't remember that fight. Tonight, apparently. The, I remember watching that card. Already, that must have been one of the first cards. In the morning, so your brain not, might not be. Well, you aware of everything you're watching, all the fucking Japanese names you have to remember from a freaking. Uh, Admittedly, I was watching that event on my phone at work, so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I work not. Yeah, I work graveyard shifts, and sure enough, that that came on at like two in the morning, over here. <clears throat> so you didn't have anything to pay attention to, so why the hell not? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, for Akira, I hope you know. I, I wonder why he would decide to retire. I mean, three losses. Maybe he was going to get cut, and he thinks maybe if the UFC is going to cut me, I don't need to fight anymore because that's where I'd only want to fight. Maybe some guys retire for that reason alone, which is respectable. 
Um, but I, I can't imagine he's taking too much damage that would affect him, but if he believes that that's the case, then by all means. Yeah, and no one knows your own body better than you do. Oh, uh, especially, you know yeah. If you're doing something soft, then you got to get out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I'm... First of all, I think that also if, uh, if, a, you know, if, um... If he, if Dan Henderson, for example, is saying that he's okay to fight moving forward, then I'm gonna take his word for it. You know, so that's that's another reason why you know I just listen to the fighters. What I mean, unless they're just kidding themselves and, and they're crazy. You know, I want one more run of the title. You've been knocked out by Jab, dude. Stop. Yeah. Sometimes it's more crystal clear than others. Yeah, I mean Henderson moving down to 185, which this fight was at 185. Um, thought that that was the the reason. Uh, for saying okay, I'm on a title hunt now because now I'm at 185. Let's see where I can get. Uh, doesn't look like a good start. So, <laughs> I mean, uh, I think he should continue to fight at 185 if 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 uh if that's what he decides to do. I think that that's smart. I think he's more. I think he'll find more success at 185 than he will at 205 right now. Um, at, at least as long as he doesn't fight anybody like in the top 10 right now. Because I believe the top 10 of middleweight is just you know getting crazy uh it's getting it's kind of like welterweight right now yeah it's building up yeah it's building up really well and i, and I like that about it um so i think he should just he's another guy who should just take these money fights yeah uh <laughs> what's funny is uh michael bisping actually called him out after the event um i could, I could see him wanting redemption that's that's the career yeah especially because like you know he'd want to be able to especially now i think michael feels like oh i have much much better chance now well, mm -hmm. I, ah, man, I, I don't know. I, I wanted to also ask you, especially because you can help me break this down better than, than anybody can because you, you understand the dynamics of wrestling uh, better than most of our admins do. Uh, so how do you see Johnson versus Jones going down? Um, uh, I, don't, I don't think Johnson takes Jones down. You know, they, oh, like wrestling take down? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think there will be much wrestling involved in that fight. I think Jones will keep him at range and, and, and pick him up far. Because uh, that's kind of what John Jones does. He will put you into your strength and embarrass you. And I think that's why Gus Sim was so successful. John Jones wasn't expecting the takedown. He wasn't he wasn't reaching for that at all. And when Gus Sim came and took him down nine or ten times, it's because he was in a fight, he was in a striking stance. He was not looking for the takedown. And when you surprise him like that's one of the easiest to take down. Might have put some doubt in his mind. He might have been thinking about it too much and been more susceptible to it. Yeah. Where you're fighting Anthony Johnson, you know the takedown's a possibility. You know that him getting inside the possibility. The only way that Johnson wins is if he gets inside. He can't shoot from the outside and take him down. It's too long of a distance. And John Jones, as we all know, is really good at keeping guys on the outside. So yeah. I have to pick John Jones. And I, I John Jones is the kind of guy I will pick him until he loses. Mm -hmm. He's given me zero to ever pick against him. Yeah, I, I picked Johnson, and here's why. I think that um, he's easily the best power striker he's ever fought. And uh, another reason is because I think that the strength advantage plays well for Johnson, especially because he's not Rashad Evans-sized like Daniel Cormier is. You know what I mean? Being that small didn't help him in the John Jones fight, especially because John Jones knew that a guy that short, it would be a little easier for him to take him down. So he used his height really well in the clinch game. Which I which I thought was very impressive, um, all right, but what I think you know, just Anthony Johnson's only two inches shorter. Um, he's what? Because John Jones is six four, Anthony is six two. Um, I believe yeah, Johnson holds a strength Jones advantage. Eighty four inch reach. Yeah, eighty four inch reach, while Johnson has a seventy six, seventy seven inch reach, or something like that. Um, so I mean, but. Uh, I believe that Johnson is better at getting inside the, the reach than anybody else. I mean, Gus could do it, but, I mean, he, he paid for it by leaving himself open at times as well. But I don't think that uh, Jones can knock Johnson out. I don't believe that he'll knock him out on the feet. It will need to be one of those things where Jones need, needs to pull something crafty like a head kick or, or, some, or some kind of very unusual strike that can put him out. What's up? I can see him just swarming him, and, and it's like a, it's like a Nick, Nick Diaz kind of TKO, you know, the accumulation of strikes. Um, oh, Jones on Johnson? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, possibly. Like if he threw like a really good spinning back kick to his to his sternum or his liver or something, and then you know he's hurt, and then Jones just kind of bucks on him. Say that again. I mean, Jones is 
never displayed that kind of power to put anyone away with like a single strike. I don't think he's ever had a one strike finish. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, for for for, for Jones to finish him, it have to be a submission or a uh, an accumulation kind of knockout. Yeah, like the the one of the one of the ones that I think that Jones like if I'm Johnson thinking about how I could get finished. One would be a spinning back kick to the body, to the liver, and then just Jones just bucks on him and just throws a bunch of shots and elbows and stuff while he's down. Um, I could see that. Um, or a head kick, and then gets a little wobbly, and then Jones just takes him down and elbows him to death. You know, I could see I could see where Jones wins this. Definitely Jones has a chance of winning this. I'm not saying Johnson's going to maul him or beat him completely. I do believe Johnson has a, a great chance of winning. When Dan- when Daniel fought Jones, I really didn't give him much of a chance. I I honestly feel like Johnson will be much more successful in this fight. Um, I think that it, Johnson will use his the, the strength advantage. The fact that he's a little taller will help him in the clinch, uh, because especially because I know John John will like to pin him there and then back his feet up and then kind of just pin him there uh, at times and then look for striking. I do believe that uh, Johnson really needs to to focus on on all aspects of boxing in this fight. Especially like uh, going on the inside, being able to uh, to cut to to cut his range, and then being and then being able to find him with uppercuts. Daniel did find a really good weakness in that clinch, in that Jones left his chin open in, in, whenever he was trying to clinch strike, um, and Daniel landed very good uppercuts, but he didn't really utilize them that well after like round three. You know what I mean? He kind of steered away from it, which was a bad idea. Um, I think Johnson also, you know, presents a, a, a more mis- – like, I don't think Jones is ever going to be a guy that gets um, bothered by that kind of mystique about a guy coming in there with the power to, like Johnson has. I do believe that Jones was confident going in that Glover fight because Glover, while being one of those power strikers, isn't as fast, doesn't have the footwork of Johnson, doesn't have the, 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 the strength in the sense that he couldn't take him down and, and really work something like that. I, I believe Johnson could threaten a takedown. Taking him down is one tough thing to do for sure. Um, and, and so I can't say whether or not Johnson will or can. But I believe that Johnson has a better chance than Glover ever could. You know what I mean? That, that's what I mean. Yeah. So I just feel like Jones – yeah. Oh man. I hope he I pokes Johnson. Watch what happens next, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean if I was if I was Jones I'd I'd focus on attacking a leg. You know, yeah, that's what I've been hearing too. Like like they said he's got comically thin legs. It's it's ridiculous. He looks like a cartoon character. But so does Jones. You, stick down low. But here's the thing, is like Jones has these very skinny legs, man. And Johnson has yeah. has in recent fights shown a really effective leg kick. Uh, attack, you know what I mean? Like he kicks hard, like not like Melvin Manhoff hard, but with the with with a good, yeah, yeah, but like to the point where it's a great mix of technique and power because it hurts, yeah. but he lands it right and he's still got his hands up and he's and he's ready to counterattack should you try and, and counter the leg kick, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I I believe that you know for every leg kick John Jones tries to throw, I mean he'll try he'll try those oblique kicks, those kicks to the knees and. That stuff he was doing on Daniel and the stuff he did on to Rampage, but I believe that you know if he uh, for it, those guys weren't late kickers the way Johnson is, you know what I mean? And he's a kickboxer by trade. He'll be able to you know give 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 Jones as much as he'll try and give. So I believe Jones is really going to try and you know grapple his way to victory here. So it's just a matter of can Johnson fight that takedown? And I think that in 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 most instances he'll be able to do so. As long as his uh, as long as his technique and and he utilizes that strength advantage right and properly and, and focuses on wrestling and grappling defense for this fight, I think he's gonna be fine. I think he's gonna be able to uh, to beat John Jones. That's how I break it down to me. I I think he's a toughest test so far, but once again, I mean, I'm gonna make this breakdown really simple. Like I said, I can't bet against John Jones. <laughs> give me a reason. To yeah, man. With Anderson, I picked him to beat Weidman because Anderson Silva did not give me a reason to pick against him. Wyman gave me a reason to pick against Anderson Silva. Mm-hmm. I'm going to need Johnson in the fight to give me a reason to pick against John Jones. So until that point, I'm, I'm riding John and this. The guy's going to win until he doesn't. Is that, I'm not being like a front runner or anything. I'm not like no, I'm no, no, definitely. Runner. But if I were to put money on it, I would put it on Jones all day. For sure. How do you like uh, if if Jones does take him down? I see it being from the clinch against the cage. 
Uh, John yeah, se- Jones seems to have that's yeah. where his most his best takedowns really come from to me. Yeah, yeah, he, he's not an outside freestyle shoot, you know, shoot and grab a single guy. He's a guy to pin you, get you tight, and use his. Um, I don't know how he does it being that tall. He can somehow get good leverage down low and just trip you up. Yeah, so. I mean, he's done. He did it to Machida, Daniel. Uh, he's done it to a lot of his opponents. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's what I, Johnson I, needs I, to be I, careful of that cage. And he, and he did. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, looking back at the record, he did pretty much just go freestyle on Chael Sonnen and just double leg him every time. So he, he can do it, it's just not how he chooses to. That's the thing about that's the thing that's interesting about John Jones. Like I said, he doesn't try to fight your weakness. He fights to your strength and embarrasses you because you know you can't beat him where you should beat everyone else. Well, I would love for him to try and do that with Johnson in the stand up. <laughs> Let's see where that goes. I would love to see him try and yeah. do that in the stand up. I mean, his ego might make him do it. You never know. An ego can be a powerful thing, and an ego can be a stupid thing. Yeah, I believe here if he decides to say, I'm going to knock him out. I'll knock him out on the feet. I could beat Johnson on the feet. I would love to see where that goes. And if yeah. he's able to beat Johnson on the feet, I will join you in the sense that, okay, until he loses, I can't bet against him. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is the one they're opponent they're I believe. Gonna like someone else. They're always going to find someone else to be like, this is the guy, and of course he won't be anyone. I, people said that about Daniel. I didn't believe that was the case. Nobody yeah, should have said that about Glover because that was not definitely not the case. Um, people were behind jail when in that fight. There's I wasn't. I wanted him to win, but I knew he wouldn't. <laughs> I, I haven't thought an opponent would beat Jones since Rashad. After Rashad, I, I can't think of any opponent he's faced that I thought could beat him. Uh, I remember Gustafson thinking like, oh, he might have a chance, but you know, he probably gets I finished like in the third. Say that again. I didn't do what he did. I didn't think Gustafson would put up that kind of fight. Yeah, you know, and so, um, but yeah, like I said, since the Rashad fight, I haven't given anybody else a chance. Not Daniel, not Glover, or not uh, Gus even. So, I, and and I didn't even give Rampage much of a chance. I mean, uh, mainly because I, I felt like that long range would have killed Rampage. Sure enough, it did. So I've been, you know, uh, I, I've been, I, I've known how good Jones is. I do know how great he is for sure. This is the first time in like three years <laughs> that I'm actually picking somebody What's against Jones. Yeah. Huh? So where you're questioning it. Not even that I'm questioning. I do think not, Johnson not wins. Brady is just questioning his ability to win a fight against the Oh, yeah. Fight. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I believe Johnson's the guy that gets it done. I really do. And and you can say it because I'm biased, but I've been I, I've watched Johnson, and I just feel like his skill set is the perfect one to match Jones. His physique, his athleticism, I think, it'll, I think he'll be able to match John Jones and beat him in certain areas to where he'll be able to find the finish, get the win, and get that belt. And this is the first time I've ever bet or I've ever gone against John Jones in three years, and I don't even like the guy. I think as a fighter, he's one of the greatest, uh, great, greatest bits of talent we've ever seen. But he's already established himself as the greatest light heavyweight to ever. Oh, for sure. Yeah. You know, a ring or a cage. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the guy's incredible. For sure, yeah. he is. I just think that Johnson's time is now. I really do believe yeah. he gets it done. I mean, I, I, I completely respect your opinion, and you know. Maybe if I think about the fight more, I'll agree or disagree with you to a different extent. But once again, until he loses, I can't. Yeah, think that's my. Him. Yeah, but at least you heard my breakdown. Give that some food for thought. You know. Yeah, um, and I mean, if I were to pick John jo- or Anthony Johnson, it would be by doing one of the things you said, and especially finding a way to get inside that reach, which unless he lets you, no one's been able to do regularly. Yeah. You know I mean, obviously Cormier came up with more of a wrestling type of footwork to get in as opposed to a striking type of footwork with head movement and using that jab. But, I mean, like I said, until I see it. Yeah, I I understand where the difficulty in believing my craziness comes from. I know that everybody thinks I'm mad. It has nothing to do with your craziness or your breakdown. It just has to do with how good John Jones is. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's just, yeah, everybody thinks I'm out of my mind. I I don't know if you remember Seth Mitchell from MMA Aliens, which is a group that you and I are both a part of. Me and him could not have been more on the, on the opposite terms of where Johnson really is in the division, and so, um, and yeah, like like I said, ninety percent, ninety nine percent of everybody that I knew in my MMA circle told me he couldn't get it done. And man, one of the greatest nights ever. Couldn't tell you how much I screamed. It was awesome. I yeah, I came in, I watched that, and I'm like, wow, those last two uppercuts where he made him into a bobblehead doll. Oh, uh, little knock. Well, no, no, where he made 
Augustus in the Bible. Oh, uh, yeah. I, 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 was, I was especially impressed by the fact that, you know, Johnson didn't allow himself to get too carried away because Gus did land a couple good shots, but he stayed patient and cut him off. He was cutting him off from getting around away from him, you know what I mean? So, um, man, I just, like I said, it's that footwork, that hand speed, uh, the movement. I, I'm, I think uh, he's ready. Uh, that's yeah. what I'm saying. On that note, let's, uh, let's get this wrapped up. I got to go to bed. Hey, All right, then, brother. Well, first, I mean, is there anything else you wanted to talk about? Um, yeah. on, on this podcast, no. I think we wanted to talk about, you know, the idea of, like, back in the Friday days, there were different brains, mm-hmm. different options. But I want to save that for a different one. I want to have, like, like, a nice lengthy discussion on that. So we'll do that maybe later this week, maybe next week. Yeah, we're doing this late at night, people, for anybody that doesn't know. Um, but it's 11.24. I got class at 7, so I got to get Damn, it. dude. All right, then, brother. I'll let you hit out. Uh, fight fans, Perfect. please, if you want to contact us, uh, you know you can by messaging us on the MMA discussion Facebook page, um, as well as I- I've been noticing the numbers have been going up on our podcast, which is awesome. Please keep subscribing. Yeah. Keep listening. Tell your friends. Spread the word. Uh, to, get, to contact me on Twitter, go at, at my Twitter handle is at Nick the Phantom. Um, you can also uh, please visit our site, Sports of Anarchy, uh, as, and as well as visit our uh, sponsors, SubmissionFC.com and MMAProfit.com. Uh, we appreciate you guys. Have a safe rest of the day. Adam, thanks for coming on, brother. I appreciate you. Thank you, Nick. Appreciate it too, buddy. Good talk.